Hello, everyone, and welcome back to English 2367, otherwise known as Language, Identity, and Culture in the U.S. Experience. And of course, our theme is Making the Self or Making the Selfie, Social Mediated Representation and Identities. This is my weekly overview for you. This is, of course, week two in the semester. And as a reminder, my name is Caitlin Marisol Sweeney Romero. I'm your instructor for this course, and you're welcome to call me KS, K Swizzle instructor Sweeney Romero or Professor Sweeney Romero, an answer to any of those four names. You may notice, or hopefully you don't notice, um, I have a pretty nasty cold that it came down with as of Friday, uh, really unexpectedly. And so unfortunately, whereas last week was me getting in the process of getting caught up for the summer, uh, this week I am just now fighting my way through this cold. And so I definitely apologize for the sound of my voice and the fact that I'll have to pause periodically during the course of this lecture and my focus lecture too, uh, to be able to just catch my breath. Um, and so I definitely appreciate your patience and understanding. If for whatever reason, and I do not judge you if this is the case, if for whatever reason the sound of my um, voice in this state is difficult to listen to or difficult to understand, I do have the uh, slides posted in the description box of this YouTube video like I do for every lecture that I offer. And so I completely understand if you need to kind of default to looking at the slides a bit more in depth or separately than you normally would, uh, given that I do, of course, display them as well during my lecture. Um, so without further ado, and with trying to suppress some coughing, let's go ahead and talk about the agenda. <clears throat> All right, rather unsuccessful in the coughing suppression. Um, so on the agenda for this week, we have three sections that I would like for us to really tackle. Uh, and, you know, as I mentioned during last week's lectures, of course, the overview lecture is designed for me to remind you of what you need to have on your radar as discussed in the schedule of assignments document. But in addition to that, I really try to use the on the agenda overview um, or just overview lecture, I should say, as a way to make sure that you get a sense of what I'm thinking in terms of why I'm putting different materials together and really to preview topically what our focus is for the week before I really explain expand on that in our focus lecture. And so you'll see from the agenda, we have this week's theme of algorithmic spectacle and erasure, hashtag shadow bands and trending reactions. We're gonna talk about that theme by way of some preliminary guiding questions that I'll offer each week, just to get you started, given that you're ideally watching this overview lecture prior to starting the reading and viewing for the week. And then, of course, are returning to the focus lecture as being kind of your next point of connection with me after you've done that reading and viewing over the course of the week. I also would like to talk through this week's to-do list in terms of the tasks that you're going to want to complete before watching the next lecture, which, of course, I just mentioned relates to what you need to read and what you need to view. And then finally, we'll spend a good amount of time talking about the assignments snapshots or an overview of week two assignments, one of which should look, of course, pretty familiar to you, which is the highlight reel number two. And then we'll also talk about response paper one, which will be new to us as of this week, but we'll see a second, a second iteration of later in the uh, first month of the semester. So let's go ahead and begin by talking about this week's theme. So as I mentioned, this week's theme is algorithmic spectacle and erasure, hashtags, shadow bans, and trending reactions. And I really try when it comes to our weekly themes to think about what are some of the key concepts that are going to come up in the reading that we really want to be attentive to, but also beyond that, how do we really want to be thoughtful and thinking about the types of terms that we are deploying throughout the course of the semester. And so as you'll see from the readings and then see kind of expanded on in the assigned viewings for this week, when we're talking about algorithmic spectacle and erasure, some of what I want you to keep in mind goes back a little bit to what we talked about briefly last week, which is how are these social media platforms that we're talking about perhaps using in our own lives uh, beyond this class, right? Comprised of algorithms that determine to what extent is a creator's content visible to the public? Is it restricted in view from the public? And especially when we talk about social media platforms, we really wanna be thoughtful about what are the types of formal and informal terms and conditions that are utilized in these digital spaces. So as you'll see in particular, 
from one of the articles, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, what does it mean to be appropriately creating content that upload that up, um, aligns with, sorry, the guidelines or the expectations for a particular social media profile's, um, you know, terms of service, right? Um, you may have the experience of when you create a profile on a, um, you know, digital website of some kind that you are prompted to click that you've read and agree with the terms and conditions or terms of service for that particular site. And that's a, an image that I want you to keep in mind and be thinking about when you're engaging with this question of what does it mean to be in alignment with the algorithm? But beyond that, I also want you to consider what forces are in place or what mechanisms are in place, not by the creator's own design that potentially restricts how their content is being distributed to the public or even on what terms the public is viewing that content. And so from there, in thinking about the kind of binary opposites of a spectacle and erasure, spectacle, of course, being the idea that something is on you know, massive display and really has a lot of eyes on it, and erasure, as we saw from last week, being an issue in which something is really hidden from view or minimized in contact from the public, we want to really be thinking about then hashtags, shadow bans, and trending reactions as being three forms of digital tools, if you will, that are going to be relevant for helping us to understand the language of social media platforms that really convey or allow us to kind of delve into these aspects of how algorithms work for and against us. So for example, with hashtags, we saw some discussion of this last week with the hashtag girls like us article, which I want you to keep in mind for this week. But I want us to really continue thinking about <laughs> how do hashtags function as a digital tool that can hyperlink uh, content from one place to another and redirect us both literally and in an abstract sense um, into conversations that are important that we are engaged with, or also perhaps can be hyperlinking us into spaces that are hostile or not safe, especially when we talk about Black women's experiences on the internet and people of color in general. With shadow bans, uh, and we'll see this term more explicitly defined in the reading for this week, we wanna think about how if hashtags can function as a form of visibility or offering the opportunity to be clued into a conversation that's happening online, even if you're not in the same physical space as someone else, how do shadow bans prevent this kind of online community from happening? And this is gonna be particularly important for us in thinking about if there are certain affordances with social media that allow us to create spaces that are affinity spaces or you know, feel comforting or exciting or safe in some capacity, how does being shadow banned prevent those spaces from really materializing or even from growing? And finally, trending reactions. This is a term I kind of use to think about the ways that we see, you know, topics trending on Twitter, how we see events, you know, coming up, even just at, if we think about mainstream media, the news ticker or the Chiron that we see in, um, you know, network news, where it's sort of that um, piece of the bottom of the screen where you see kind of headlines scrolling across while the news anchor is speaking. I want us to really be thinking about trending reactions by way of not only what topics are trending on Twitter, but also how spaces like Twitter or like Instagram or Facebook or TikTok are spaces where topics that are trending in the cultural milieu, both nationally, regionally, and even you know globally, right, are being reacted to by content creators in many different mediums and forms that then expand into larger discourses that we see then kind of being engaged with by way of the scholarly content that we're looking at for this week. So with that being said, the three guiding questions that I really want you to keep in your back pocket to just kind of help frame what we'll be moving into both in terms of what you are engaging with independently and also what I'll be discussing uh, by way of my focus lecture are as follows. So my first guiding question cluster is, do social justice movements need social media visibility to achieve their goals? What digital tools do they use to do so? So with this question cluster, I'm really getting at when we talk about movement work that either originates online or kind of takes place online after having some components that are in person, right? Um, we wanna think about what does it mean to achieve social media visibility? And is this necessary as a component for activists to be able to accomplish what it is that they said is their goals, right? Or is it possible to have movements or to make social change without using social media whatsoever? 
And especially when we kind of think about the possibility of activists or even just everyday people who maybe don't identify themselves as activists, right? When we think about visibility online, we wanna be really conscientious of what tools or terms are we utilizing intentionally to really describe what visibility is comprised of. So if we're saying that someone is represented well on the internet, and by well here, I mean like has visibility where the public is familiar with them in their kind of local or larger environments, what tools are they using to achieve this? Are they using, you know, a, some sort of convergent video player? Are they using hashtags? Are they using Instagram captions? Are they using, you know, um, some sort of challenge on TikTok, right? What do we mean specifically when we say visibility on social media, okay? And does a movement need to be visible online or can they just be visible in person to accomplish what they want to? My second guiding questions for you are, how and why are images of black people suffering circulated online and how does this enact harm? This is gonna be incredibly crucial for us, uh, given that, particularly when we look at Sophia Umoja Noble's article for this week, She's really offering some useful frameworks for thinking about what does it mean to talk about harm caused by the internet, as well as I want us just to be really thoughtful and thinking about, you know, particularly if you had the experience of you were online, you know, in 2020, when the global uprisings were happening because of the murders of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and many other Black folks who were lost that year and many years preceding it. I think there's something really necessary to consider when it comes to for those of us who do potentially occupy some kind of digital presence in the 2020s, <coughs> excuse me, how does the way that we post online, even if there's perhaps good intention behind it, how does it perhaps traumatize and trigger folks who experience um, different versions of these events um, in their daily lives, right? And so I'll kind of speak more to this in my focus lecture, and hopefully we'll have a bit more of a voice then. Um, but what I'm really getting at here is, in thinking back to times like 2020 and, you know, many years preceding it, when a tragedy happens, such as a, you know, police murder of a Black person, um, how do the types of images that get shared online uh, perhaps further the harm or further the pain experienced by Black folks um, in the U.S. and also globally? And then finally, how does brownface and yellowface in mainstream film relate to digital blackface on social media? So you may recall from my lecture last week, I talked about brownface as a concept and used an example of George Shakiris and how he um, appeared in West Side Story as opposed to in White Christmas. Um, and definitely the videos that were offered for last week talk about yellowface. And I also made some brief mention about blackface in the course of my lecture. You'll see one of the videos for this week expands on understanding kind of a historical context of blackface that I think is really necessary for anyone doing popular culture and media studies work to understand how that factors into contemporary trends that we're seeing now in spaces like TikTok and Instagram. But also my goal here is in getting you to start thinking about between, between weeks one and two, how are we already seeing terms that are similar in nature kind of popping up in ways that can help us to really understand how the internet is re-perpetuating issues that already exist and come to us from previous forms such as television and film. And of course, last week's theme was from legacy media representation to social media itself images, visibility on what terms. And I want you to continue to keep last week's theme in your mind, not only because that will be important to succeed in completing your response paper one, which we'll talk about later, but also because I very intentionally scaffold our weeks so that you will hopefully see the points of connection from one week to the next. And I very intentionally wanted us to talk about spectacle and erasure following our discussions of what it means to be visible um, on the internet and in representation via you know, media in the United States as a whole. This is gonna take us now to this week's to-do list. Um, and again, this to-do list is always going to be really repurposing or in some respects, just kind of expanding on what's already represented in the schedule of assignments document that you'll find on Carmen and that I talked about more substantially in the week one um, lectures. Um, I did wanna give a content warning really quickly before I forget to do so, because I think it's important beyond offering a content warning in the syllabus. So you'll notice here on the left side of the screen that I put content warning for Sophia Umoja Noble's article and for all of the viewings, um, and this is important. So when it comes to Umoja Noble's work, 
which I'll talk about more when we get to readings, as well as the viewings that we have for this week. All of them are talking about different variations of um, harm enacted on Black, Afro-Indigenous, Indigenous, indigenous um, folks in the United States by various institutions, whether it's by police, um, whether it's by, <coughs> um, you know, platforms like Instagram. And so I did want to be really intentional in foregrounding that if you anticipate that it will be challenging or triggering for you to read or engage with one or more of these materials, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and I would be more than happy to talk through with you how I can be of support um, to make sure that this week in this class is equitable in terms of you being able to participate and contribute. I also just wanted to note that in terms of the Umoja Noble reading in particular, there are a few images that she includes and in the course of her argument, of course, she does contend as to why the inclusion of these images is relevant to the point that she's making. But I did want to give you a content warning in case it would be beneficial um, to know in advance that those are coming, because um, she is talking quite substantially in a historical context and a, con and a contemporary context as to the ways that the internet and other forms of um, just popular culture and media and just the US's cultural milieu overall has really contributed numerous forms of harm and enacted numerous forms of harm on Black folks um, over the course of time. And so while I feel that this is an important aspect to what we're talking about this week in terms of algorithmic spectacle and erasure, and I think I, we would not be doing that topic due justice if we didn't talk about these topics in relationship to the theme, I do also want to make sure I flag these things that we can make sure that you, you're protected in terms of your wellness uh, and your well-being. Um, I did want to also mention briefly that with the viewings for this week, and I kind of already hinted at this, so whereas the Umoja Noble really talks about a kind of historical perspective on the ways that the internet enacts harm on Black folks, um, with the viewings for this week, the um, first one that you'll see listed of unpacking the racism of digital Blackface in the information age also talks a bit more substantially than I did last week about Blackface and kind of the ways that there are forms of it contemporaneous to our current moment. There are some images that may be troubling within the course of that video, though I think they're important to be aware of. Um, and in terms of the uh, YouTube video titled Why Are Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Cases Being Ignored? That particular video is also talking about the relationship between police departments and indigenous communities, and in particular is attending to the ways in which indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit folks who have gone missing are not well represented in police missing person databases. And so if you find that that topic similarly to or differently than those covered by Umo Noble's article and the um, digital blackface video is troubling or triggering, please do not hesitate to reach out to me and we can discuss ways to help you process and just protect your wellness this week. Um, Okay, and then um, I'm going to go ahead and transition us to the next slide to kind of get into more detail about your expectations for this week, or my expectations for you this week, I should say. <laughs> so in terms of this week's readings, and I've already kind of included some preliminary notes on this in regards to my content warning, you have three readings that you need to complete. You have chapter four of So What, specifically pages 75 to 91. I posted on Carmen and sent a Carmen message out that there are um, links available to you on the Carmen page under the course materials module um, that detail where you can rent or purchase copies of So What and the other textbook we'll be using this semester titled Who Says. You do need the third edition for each of these books. Um, I find that the ebook option for these books are the best or easiest to work with. And I've flagged those on the um, list that I've posted and made available to you on Carmen. But if you have any trouble accessing So What, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. I know that reading a textbook as a companion piece to doing other work for a course such as this one may feel really tedious, um, but I've tried to be really purposeful in pulling out the pages that are gonna be most relevant and useful for us, particularly because since this is an accelerated course, you are going to need to be familiar with various aspects of writing process covered by these books to ensure that you can perform to your best ability on the larger writing assignments that will come up very quickly in the second month of the semester. So please, please, please make sure at the very least that you're skimming these pages and ideally you're reading them in depth and then able to pair that reading 
with my discussion of these pages in the course of my focus lectures. In addition to reading this excerpt from chapter four of So What, I ask that you also read in full the article by Sophia Umoja Noble titled Critical Surveillance Literacy in Social Media, Interrogating Black Death and Dying Online, which of course I just gave a content warning for previously um, on the previous slide. Um, you may find that reading the abstract for Umoja Noble's article will be beneficial to get a sense of what she's talking about in advance of diving into the article as a whole. It is uh, quite, I don't want to say it's lengthy, but I will say that it's quite robust in terms of what she is covering, but I feel that it's still quite accessible. I will devote a good chunk of my focus lecture to talking through some of the key points in Emoja Noble's article, um, but there's no real replacement for actually reading the article first and then engaging with my focus lecture, and so I do ask that you do that. It may be beneficial as well to print this article since it is a bit more substantial and highlight some key points that you're familiar with those before going into my focus lecture. And then finally, your third reading for this week is Callie Middlebrook's paper, The Gray Area, Instagram Shadow Banning and the Erasure of Marginalized Communities. This is a very quick read and quite easy, I think. Um, I purposely put the Middlebrook paper alongside the Emoja Noble essay, not only because I wanted there to be a nice balance in terms of having one longer reading and one shorter reading besides the textbook chapter. But beyond that, I think topically it'll be really important to pay attention to how Umoja Noble is in some respects talking about a hyper visibility or the ways in which you know, images and videos displaying Black folks in various states of death and dying are hyper visible or hyper circulated on the internet. Whereas Callie Middlebrook is getting at the issue of the extent to which content created by marginalized creators on the internet is prevented from being visible. And so is kind of um, like a, experiencing a type of under visibility or restricted visibility, if you will. And I hope that in saying those terms that also takes you back to the um, Ducros et al article from last week, the Asian American and Pacific Islanders on TV article, because they get at a similar kind of um, binary as well, of either overrepresented or underrepresented which I'll expand on more with the assignments. This week's viewing, you have three TikToks and two YouTube videos to watch. Of course, they are all pretty short in length. Um, I do this purposefully to make sure that you're getting some key examples of concepts and topics covered by the secondary readings, um, but you know, covered in such a way that they can hopefully be a useful visual for you to understand what folks are talking about. Um, the two YouTube videos that you have for this week, of course, are Unpacking the Racism of Digital Blackface in the Information Age, that's the bottom left corner. You also have Why Are Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Cases Being Ignored Between the Lines, and that's the top left corner. These videos, I think, offer really helpful surveys of what it is are the kind of key topics covered. And I'll expand more in my focus lecture as to how the missing and murdered Indigenous women's cases video is connected to the Cali Middlebrook article. Um, but really kind of the Umoja Noble article is in some ways one that I see as being in dialogue with the Unpacking the Racism article. And so I want you to be kind of thinking about some of those connections, particularly as you go into producing your highlight reel for this week. In terms of the TikToks that you have for this week, um, you have a TikTok by Shaina Nova, who is Inuit. Um, a TikTok by Nirtuli Wilkins, who's Diné and Lumbe, and a TikTok by Kara Roseas, who's Chappaquiddick Wampanoag. And all three of these creators are indigenous. Um, Kara Roseas, who's on the, on the right side of the screen, is Afro-Indigenous and, and kind of identifies that alongside her Chappaquiddick Wampanoag identity. Um, something I'll note here and I'll kind of return to throughout the semester is when talking about or citing indigenous creators and scholars, you always want to include their indigenous um, identity or affiliation when also referencing their name. This is a practice that is done um, in part because there is sort of a longstanding issue in that there's a misinterpretation that all indigenous or native people are exactly the same or have the same identity. And so you'll find in my lectures and in our discussions of these creators works um, that we wanna make sure that we are always including their um, tribal or indigenous affiliation alongside their name in parentheses to acknowledge what groups that they are part of. And I'll expand on that more in my focus lecture. Let's go ahead and transition to assignment snapshots, but really quickly, I'm actually gonna pause to cough, and then I will be back to talk about your assignments for this week. 
All right, I am back to talk about our assignment snapshot for this week. <clears throat> so you have two assignments due for this week, which is standard for the course of the semester. I did this purposely also because as you'll see as the weeks go on, I try to alternate between you know, times that you're giving feedback to your peers, as well as doing kind of smaller and larger assignments that are really in conversation with each other. So the first assignment that you have due for this week is highlight reel number two, which is due on Wednesday, May 18th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. Highlight reels should of course be familiar to you now, now that you've completed and submitted your first highlight reel. Um, my hope is that the first highlight reel helped to just kind of get your feet wet in terms of learning how to do a slightly different kind of assignment than you may already be used to. Um, highlight reels I found when teaching this course are in general one that's kind of awkward to get started with because it's likely you haven't had an assignment like this before. But my hope is that as you continue to do them, they feel like they get a little bit easier. But I do want to remind you that you need to do a different medium every time that you create a highlight reel. So if for highlight reel number one, you created a TikTok, then you cannot create a TikTok for any of your remaining highlight reel submissions. If for highlight reel number one, you created uh, you know, a Canva infographic, you cannot create a Canva infographic for any of the remaining highlight reels and so on. If you have any questions about highlight reels, or honestly, if you ever would like me to take a look at a draft of a highlight reel before you submit it, I'm more than happy to do so. I'm also happy to talk about highlight reels during office hours. Basically, any way that I can be of support, please let me know. So like I said, you've already turned in highlight reel number one, and you are now in the process of completing highlight reel number two. Now highlight reel number two, and of course this being week two, is going to kick off our more consistent schedule compared to last week, which means that again, your first weekly assignment is due on Wednesdays at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. However, I do want to reiterate that every Wednesday deadline does have a deadline extension baked into the schedule without you needing to request one. So if you cannot meet this Wednesday, deadline for whatever reason, you are permitted to submit Wednesday assignments without losing points up until Fridays at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern. After this extended deadline, the assignment is considered missing and will be labeled as a zero on carbon. You may be thinking, why is it not a later date? Like, why is it Friday? Well, um, for highlight reels, um, especially in weeks that your peers are responding to them, um, it is beneficial to have them turned in by Fridays at three because whether it is I or your peers who is responding to them, it creates enough time to be able to do so in a timeline that is most useful for you to get feedback that you can actually apply for this course. Um, but especially because since you do have two assignments due each week, I have found that when I make two assignments due at the same time and on the same date, one assignment tends to suffer because you might be doing them both at the same time or rushing to do them at the last minute. And so to kind of try to be best protective of your time and your capacity, I do ask that if you do not have highlight reel number two done by Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern, it would be best um, to make sure that you are following that extended deadline of Friday at three o'clock p.m. Eastern. Now, for whatever reason, you cannot meet either the Wednesday or Friday deadline please reach out to me in advance. Um, but I am expecting that highlight reel number one is submitted by Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern or by Friday at three o'clock p.m. Eastern. Also, if at any point my, my lectures during the overview uh, lecture sound repetitive, that's a great sign. It means that you are remembering the material. And so just keep that as something in your back pocket as well. If you're like, this feels really repetitive, or I already know this. That's fantastic. That means that you've already committed this information to memory. I'm just doing my due diligence to make sure that I have covered it to the extent that I feel is necessary to make sure that you've got the reminders that you need since I don't see you in person. All right, so I'm not gonna go exhaustively through the highlight reels prompt again because it is something that I covered in a great amount of detail last week in week one. But I do want to remind you that you have four submissions overall, May 13th, May 18th, May 25th, and June 1st. And so as a reminder, we will be doing highlight reel submissions every week for the first month of the semester. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I have also included here in case it's useful to see it again, the prompt for highlight reel number, or highlight reel number one, uh, for all the highlight reels, excuse me. And so again, again, this is going to reiterate that you're really 
making sure that you're demonstrating how the secondary sources that are assigned for this week, how those secondary sources are helping you to understand something about one or multiple of the primary sources that are assigned for this week. And so it's going to be crucial that in the course of completing your highlight reel, you're really thinking about how can you sort of practice the steps that are listed here of, you know, gaining practice with synthesizing arguments and major takeaways from the scholarly and popular readings, considering how you can apply key concepts and draw points of connection between these readings and popular culture texts, and to continue developing your understanding of the interplay between content and form in a text by engaging um, with you know, the highlight reels. And of course, this week you don't have a real reactions, but I still encourage you to look at your peers' highlight reels each week because I think it is beneficial to your learning, um, especially if at any point you encounter a reading that feels particularly challenging. It can help to see how a peer has tried to tackle that material in their respective work, okay? Um, so again, you should be making it very clear to your reader who this week will be me for highlight reel number two, how it is that those secondary sources and one in particular is giving you some insight into understanding one or multiple of the primary sources assigned for this week. I did wanna draw your attention to um, at the bottom of the screen in case you didn't notice it last time or didn't have a chance to look at this already, that there is a hyperlink posted um, that indicates that if you'd like to view examples of what students have created in the past for their highlight reels, you can go ahead and click that link that is highlighted in blue. I did want to note once again that the version of the highlight reels that you'll see represented here were created for a synchronous in-person course. And so students only needed to tackle, you know, one assigned text for the week um, and didn't need to tackle kind of the secondary source and it being sort of a lens for one or multiple primary sources um, as, a, as extensively as you all are. Um, and so you might see some differences between kind of how you tackle the highlight reels versus how they are represented in these examples. Um, oops, meant to switch those slides. Either way, um, in the event that you've not had a chance to look at some of these examples, I do encourage that you look at them, especially if you just find yourself running out of ideas. Um, they can be really helpful just to get a sense of how other students have just tackled this assignment before. And of course, in the event that you're just really struggling with highlight reels, Again, I'm happy to talk via office hours or email, but I do encourage you to really follow those writing steps of watch and read, reflect on material, identify elements, take time to outline, incorporate tools, no assumptions made, and get creative, um, all of which are, of course, talked about more substantially in the latter half of the highlight reels prompt, as well as covered more substantially by me in the week one uh, lectures. I'm going to pause really quick uh, and just to cough and catch my breath, and then I'll be back to talk about the response papers. All right, everybody, I'm back to talk about the response papers. So the response papers, which are new to us this week, um, are you know two assignments, and you'll turn them in during the um, first month of the semester, one during week two, which is this week, and one during week four. And these response papers are going to alternate with weeks that you have the real reaction. So you had a real reaction in week one, you've got response paper one in week two, you've got a real reaction in week three, and response paper two in week four. And so in terms of the deadline for this assignment, and I include um, Oops, that should have response papers on the right side of the screen. I apologize for that mistake. I'll make sure to correct that before I post the slides. My bad, I'm so sorry. Um, go ahead and disregard the right side of the screen until I correct that in the slides that are in the description box. Oh, what a, what a moment. Um, in terms of the response papers, um, this is going to be your second deadline for this week. So response paper one will be due on Saturday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. Now, much like your weekly Wednesday deadline, you do have a deadline extension baked into the schedule each week. So if you are not able to meet the Saturday deadline for response paper number one, you can turn um, this paper in up until Monday at eight o'clock a.m. Eastern without losing any points. And after this extended deadline, the assignment is considered missing and will be labeled as a zero in Carmen. So again, you have the kind of expected deadline of Saturday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern for response paper one. If you cannot meet this deadline, you can turn it in up until Monday at eight o'clock a.m. Eastern for it to still receive full credit. 
I've, go ha I've gone ahead and posted the prompt for response paper one on Carmen, and you can view it next to the um, assignment submission portal. Um, you'll find that it indicates the same information I just shared with you at the top in the header, that response paper number one has a deadline of Saturday, May 21st at 11.59 p.m. Eastern, and it's ultimately accepted up until Monday, May 23rd at 8 o'clock a.m. Eastern. And my hope is that this timeline is beneficial to you if you need more time for whatever reason. Now, at the top of the prompt, you'll see that snapshot from the syllabus is just reiterated from what we already talked about last week. <clears throat> I do this purposely to just jog your memory of what this assignment is. Um, I will not read this part out loud, but I do provide it in case it's beneficial for you to just remember what it is that this assignment in general consists of. What I am going to spend time on today is talking through the guided prompt and then kind of the section that comes after this um, that covers formatting as well as the questions that you will want to engage with with this response paper. Now, the response paper is different from highlight reels in the sense that highlight reels are going to be, you know, your sort of um, opportunity to do a creative and critical reflection on how one secondary source for the week gives you insight into one or multiple of the primary sources for the week. Response papers are a little bit different. A response paper is going to task you with really thinking about, you know, two weeks at a time as opposed to one week as a standalone part in the semester. And so what I mean by this is that a response paper is designed to give you the opportunity to return to what we covered the past week and place that past week in conversation with the current week that we are covering. I do this purposefully, one, to make sure that you kind of are able to see how the class is building on itself, and two, because we will really rely on some of these secondary mm -hmm. sources, for example, um, in later parts in the semester or later weeks in the semester, I should say, when we're talking about writing craft by way of producing a large argument or kind of extended analysis. And so it's going to be important that you've read everything, watched everything, and are familiar with everything in this course because this course does build on itself. So the guided prompt here is that you'll first want to read and watch everything that is assigned for week two. Then you'll wanna revisit and reflect on the materials you engage with during week one. That is the readings, viewings, lectures, and the highlight reels. It's important that you've completed all of the work for weeks one and two before starting this response paper so that you are in the best possible position to write a strong analysis. It may be beneficial to review the writing steps again, with the exception of incorporate tools, since you don't need to use a social media tool here, to organize your thoughts before you begin this essay. So once you've done that, if you're confident that you've covered and you've got a good grasp on everything from weeks one and two, you'll now select one of the question clusters listed on the next page as your focus for this response paper. Your task is to use what you have read, watched, engaged with, and listened so far to produce a clear, concise analysis of how week two's theme is in conversation with the theme covered in week one. More specifically, your response should one, reflect your familiarity with the assigned primary source material from both weeks, two, demonstrate your comprehension of assigned secondary source material from both weeks, and three, offer your preliminary understandings of how the topics covered in these weeks relate to the course's overall theme. When answering your question cluster in your essay, you will want to consider how you can best organize your paragraphs so that your responses are clear and so you can demonstrate how you are refining your understanding of the topics covered by the primary and secondary sources assigned for both weeks. So before I move on, I just wanna reiterate this and explain it a little bit more. You're going to choose one set of questions to engage with in the course of your response paper. Your response paper should demonstrate that you have a good grasp of what was covered in week one and week two. And beyond that, your response paper should demonstrate that you've actually read and watched everything that was listed for weeks one and two. It should show that you've got a good comprehension of the secondary sources or the assigned articles that offer some key concepts and key argumentative claims that are gonna be important for us moving forward in tackling the class theme. And also that you're gonna to wanna to really demonstrate how you're starting to tease out how the weeks thus far have addressed this larger course theme of social mediated representation, right? And kind of making the self or making the selfie. So the formatting requirements for this assignment is it's a two to three page double spaced essay. 
Two pages is the minimum length for this assignment, and the essay may be longer than three pages if necessary for conveying your point clearly, but it should not exceed four double-spaced pages. Now, if a student produces a two-page essay rather than a two-and-a-half or three-page essay, the essay should fill the entire second page. If it does not fill the entire second page, it does not count as a two-page essay. That's a page and a half or a page and a quarter. So it's going to be incredibly important that you fill that entire second page if for whatever reason you're turning in a two-page essay instead of an essay that's a little bit longer than that length. Your essay should also feature MLA format with proper header, line spacing, and page number, and no works cited pages required. I will talk about formatting guidelines in my focus lecture so that you have those um, uh, what's it called? Those guidelines or those um, examples available to you. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the font for your essay should be in Times New Roman style, 12 point in size, and should appear within one inch margins. I'll talk about that more in the focus lecture. File types that I accept, a Word document is preferred, but PDF and Google Doc are also accepted. If you're submitting a Google Doc, you should be sure, you need to be sure to enable sharing permissions so that it can be edited by me. Um, and I include the email that you should share it with. The document must be readable slash accessible to me by the deadline. And again, these document types, I have file preferences, but they are ultimately going to be submitted at the Carmen Assignment Submission Portal that's labeled as Response Paper 1. If you anticipate needing an alternate submission schedule beyond the Monday, May 23rd extended deadline for this assignment, this request should be made by Thursday, May 19th of this week at the latest and is not guaranteed unless it is confirmed by me. So I should be hearing from you by Thursday if for whatever reason you cannot make the Saturday or Monday deadlines for response paper number one. So the TLDR or the too long didn't read here is you will need to select one set of questions to respond to from the following three slides. These are of course also shown on the prompt. You will need to address all of the questions listed in that set of questions from the slide you choose. Do not only engage with one question on the slide, you are working off of the whole list. That is, you should be basing your response off of one of the three question sets, either question or either option number one, option number two, or option number three. That means you choose one set of questions and answer all the questions in that group, okay? I think it'll make more sense when I show you what these look like. So I'm gonna kind of skip forward and then come back. This is question set option number one. This is question set option number two. And this is question set option number three. Now you are tasked with choosing one of these options, but you need to answer and address the questions listed under this option in the course of your response paper. Okay, so I'm going to talk through what these are and read them out to you with some, you know, kind of shortening here and there because my voice is not super strong, just so you have a sense of what your options are. So for question set option number one, the kind of organizing question that I'm asking here is, what are key differences in representation on television versus on social media? And so for this option, you will be basing your response off of the uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders on TV article, as well as based off of the gray area, Instagram shadow banning and the erasure of marginalized communities article. And then where possible, you'll wanna discuss how one or multiple assigned viewings from weeks one and two help to visualize the key concepts and arguments offered by Ducros et al and Middlebrook, the authors of these two works, okay? So I'm gonna just kind of briefly talk through these. So for this, so this um, set of guiding questions, you'll be tackling the following. In their 2018 article, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders on TV, how do the authors make an argument about Asian American and Pacific Islander representation? What do they base their argument on and how does this argument build on previous research they have conducted? In particular, how do the authors differentiate between the terms overrepresentation and underrepresentation? Where in the article do they apply these key concepts and how do these concepts illustrate their overall argument? Relatedly, how might the issues covered in Cali Middlebrook's 2020 paper, The Gray Area, Instagram shadow banning and the erasure of marginalized communities expand on Ducros et al's discussion of what it means to be represented in media? Are there any key concepts offered by Middlebrook that are useful when discussing how representation on social media is different from representation in television? In particular, what is her argument about the experiences of marginalized people on social media compared to those who are not marginalized? 
how might this argument connect with what Ducros et al. argue in their article? So if you decide to choose question set option number one as your prompt for response paper one, you will be paying attention to how uh, the Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders on TV article is putting forth an argument, right? You're gonna talk through what this argument is based on and how is this argument you know, in conversation with research that the authors have done previous to writing this particular article. And I especially want you to focus on how are they offering the terms overrepresentation and underrepresentation in the course of their argument, okay? Now, you'll also be addressing in the same response paper how you can see points of connection between the Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders on TV article with the gray area article. So you're thinking about them as kind of working off of each other. And so when you're talking about the Middlebrook paper, you're gonna to wanna to think about how does this paper perhaps expand on some of the points offered by the other article, but expand in ways that help us to start to understand and talk about the differences between what it means to be represented on social media as opposed to being represented on television, which is what Ducros and the other authors are covering in their respective article. And you want to be paying especially um, strong attention to how in the second paper, the author is working through what does it mean for someone to be shadow banned on Instagram as a marginalized creator and how is that different than how a non-marginalized creator experiences this digital space, okay? Your second question cluster or set of questions to engage with um, kind of are organized around this larger question of how do marginalized creators use social media tools to change representation? And I'll talk more about the term marginalized in my focus lecture, but the kind of guiding questions here include the following. In their 2020 article, hashtag girls like us, trans feminist advocacy and community building, the authors adapt key points from their larger work, hashtag activism, networks of race and gender justice, which was published by the MIT Press in 2020. What is their argument as to how film and television portrayals of trans women have affected how the public views trans women's identities and personhood? How might the key concepts of stereotype or erasure introduced during the week one lecture uh, be applicable to Jackson et al's argument? Additionally, what core example or examples do they use to differentiate between how trans women have been represented in mainstream media and how black trans women have represented themselves through social media? Who are the leaders of this movement and what have they achieved by using digital tools in innovative ways? Relatedly, how is Callie Middlebrook's definition of shadow banning in her 2020 paper, The Gray Area, Instagram shadow banning and the erasure of marginalized communities relevant when analyzing Jackson et al's argument about hashtag girls like us. Based on these articles, how might we recognize the differences in Twitter and Instagram's user interfaces and the challenges associated with achieving visibility online? Additionally, how does Jackson et al's use of the term new media network differ from Middlebrook's use of the term global community? And where possible, discuss how one or multiple assigned viewings from weeks one and two help to visualize the key concepts and arguments offered by Jackson et al in Middlebrook. So if you choose to go with option two, you're looking at the hashtag girls like us article and placing it in conversation with the gray area article. Okay, and so the goals here for this particular prompt, if you choose to work off of it, is to really think about how does the hashtag girls like us article make some pretty clear connections between how representation is changing on social media due to the work of black trans women versus how mainstream media and film and television have chosen to represent trans folks without including them in those, discuss those discussions or those decisions, right? So you're gonna wanna really tackle how does the hashtag girls like us article already do some of this work of acknowledging how marginalized creators are using social media to change what representation looks like for trans folks? And then in thinking about the Callie Middlebrook essay, how does the, the term that she offers of shadow banning help us to better understand some of the challenges that come up for marginalized creators who are trying to use social media to change representation, right? And this is gonna be particularly important because we don't wanna accidentally suggest that social media is a perfect alternative to um, mainstream media where there's no issues or no challenges faced by creators, right? So this particular prompt is really getting at the question of, how does one achieve visibility on social media as an alternative to mainstream media? But what are the challenges associated with gaining that visibility so that you can actually change representation in the ways that you want to? 
And then finally, questions that option number three is organized around the guiding question of when is representation painful and traumatizing as opposed to empowering? So this one's a bit of a departure from what we saw discussed in the options one and two. And for this particular option, you would be looking at the Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders on TV article in conversation with uh, Sophia Omoja Noble's article, Critical Surveillance Literacy in Social Media. And then of course, when possible, you would discuss how one or multiple assigned viewings from weeks one and two help to visualize the key concepts and arguments offered by Ducros et al and Omoja Noble. So what would you be tackling if you chose this option? Well, in their 2018 article, Asian Americans and Pacific, Isl Pacific Islanders on TV, what do the authors argue are the consequences of negative and or minimal Asian American and Pacific Islander representation in television? According to the authors, what harm might be caused by negative and or minimal AAPI representation in television? How might the key concepts of stereotype or erasure introduced during the week one lecture be applicable to Ducros et al's argument. And I wanna pause here to say, you'll notice that some of the prompts are of course working off of similar secondary sources. This is purposeful because I'm asking you based on your option to kind of choose which text from week one and week two to place in conversation with each other. But my hope is this also kind of reinforces some of the key takeaways from week one and how they're connected to week two as you work through them independently. Now, thinking about how the Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders on TV article is tackling this question of what is negative or minimal representation. If we look then to the 2018 article, Critical Surveillance Literacy in Social Media, Interrogating Black Death and Dying Online, Sophia Umoja Noble poses the crucial question on page 149, in service of whom, when discussing how the video of Eric Garner's murder was circulated online. According to Umoja Noble, who is affected by the online circulation of images and videos of Black people in states of death or dying? How does she introduce and utilize the key concepts of spe spectacle, profitability, record, and silence to explicate on the argument she puts forth regarding surveillance videos and images that go viral on the internet? Based on the examples and topics she explores, why does Umoja Noble call for a critical surveillance literacy in social media on page 155? Additionally, how might one or more of the terms offered by Umoja Noble when making her argument about internet representation be applicable to, to, Gross's, to Gross et al's argument about televisual representation? So for this one, you would be focusing on what are the negatives, what are the harms that can be caused in both television and on the internet for marginalized groups such as Asian American and Pacific Islanders and Black folks? And in particular for this one, you would be really focusing on kind of looking at key concepts offered by Umoja Noble and considering how those key concepts are giving us a framework or an understanding for why she's calling for the need for a critical surveillance literacy in social media. And I'm pointing you to specific passages in this article, many of which I talk about in the focus lecture, but I'm pointing you in specific places with this particular prompt, because here I want you, if you choose to go with this one, to really pay attention to how is she mobilizing these particular terms as language that helps us to understand the significance of this project that she's proposing, but also how can we almost work backwards? So if the previous two prompts are giving us a sense of how, does, how, does, um, how do existing mainstream media forms like television and film set a precedent that then social media is expanding on, challenging, et cetera, this one's doing the opposite of saying, how does Umoja Noble's argument about the internet and social media help us maybe go back then to looking at television and film and consider perhaps what existed there or what harms have been enacted there that we can best understand by first using language relevant to or applicable to internet studies as opposed to working in the opposite direction. Hopefully that makes sense. But basically this is a prompt that's having you work in a different direction of asking how do terms that Umoja Noble uh, uses in regards to the internet also ultimately become applicable or relevant to talking about television, okay? So that is everything that I have for you today. I hope that this lecture has been useful for thinking through expectations for the week, assignments for the week, and so on. I, again, I'm so sorry about the state of my crackly little voice. I appreciate you being here. 
And I, like I've said before, I'm happy to talk via office hours and email. However, I can be as, of assistance as you work through the materials each week. I am more than happy to do so. But uh, in the interim, as you work through your readings and viewings for this week and assignments, this is me, Case Wizzle, signing off for English 2367. And you will see me back in digital form, hopefully with camera on, when I speak with you next in my focus lecture. Have a wonderful week, and I will talk with you soon. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.